the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical psychology for today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, narrated by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. On this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from The World of the Sufi by Idris Shah. Four Part Two Sufi Influence on the Formation of Sikhism by Frederick Pincott, MRAS. The literature and traditions of Sikhism present a strange intermingling of Hindu and Mohammedan ideas, and superficial enquirers have been led to conclude that Nanak intended his creed to be a compromise between those two great religions. Dr. Trump the translator of the Adi Granth, the sacred book of the Sikhs, is, however, distinctly of the opinion that Sikhism has only an accidental relationship with Mohammedanism. In his introduction, page 101, he says, It is a mistake if Nanak is represented as having endeavoured to unite the Hindu and Mohammedan ideas about God. Nanak remained a thorough Hindu, according to all his views. And if many Muslims became his disciples, it was owing to the fact that Sufism, which all these Mohammedans professed, was in reality nothing but a pantheism, derived directly from Hindu sources and only outwardly adapted to the forms of Islam. Hindu and Muslim pantheists could well unite together as they entertained essentially the same ideas about the Supreme. In fact, the balance of evidence is heavily on the other side. A careful study of early Sikh traditions points strongly to the conclusion that the religion of Nanak was really intended as a compromise between Hinduism and Mohammedanism. Because very little seems to be known as to the views of the early Sikh teachers, it is necessary to establish the relationship which actually existed between the two faiths. The information given in this article is taken chiefly from original Punjabi books and from manuscripts in the India Office Library, and it is supported by the authority of the Adi Granth, which is the sacred canon of the Sikhs. The Janam Sakis, or biographical sketches of Nanak and his associates, contain a profusion of curious traditions which throw considerable light on the origin and development of the Sikh religion. From these old books we learn that in early life Nanak, although a Hindu by birth, came under Sufi influence and was strangely attracted by the saintly demeanour of the Fakirs, who were thickly scattered over northern India and swarmed in the Punjab. Sufism is not derived from Hindu pantheism, it arose in the very earliest days of Mohammedanism and is almost certainly due to the influence of Persian Zoroastrianism on the rude faith of Arab Islam. Persian has ever been the stronghold of Sufistic doctrine, and the leading writers who have illustrated that form of Mohammedanism have been the Persian poets Firdusi, Nizami, Sadi, Jalaluddin Rumi, Hafiz and Jami. Hafiz, the prince of Sufi poets, boldly declares, I am a disciple of the old Magians. Be not angry with me, O Sheikh. For thou gavest me a promise, he hath brought me the reality. Although this stanza alludes directly to two persons known to Hafiz, its almost obvious meaning is, I, a Persian, adhere to the faith of my ancestors. Do not blame me, O Arab conqueror, that my faith is more sublime than thine. That Hafiz meant his readers to take his words in a general sense may be inferred from the stanza in which he says, I am the servant of the old man of the tavern, i.e. the Magian, because his beneficence is lasting. On the other hand, the beneficence of the Sheikh and of the Sayyid at times is, and at times is not. Indeed, Hafiz was fully conscious of the fact that Sufism was due to the influence of the faith of his ancestors. For in another ode he plainly says, Make fresh again the essence of the creed of Zoroaster, now that the tulip has kindled the fire of Nimrod. 
and Nizami also was aware that his ideas were perilously akin to heterodoxy. For, he says in his Kuzru wa Shirin, See not in me the guide to the temple of the fire worshippers, see only the hidden meaning which cleaveth to the allegory. These quotations, which could be indefinitely multiplied, sufficiently indicate the Zoroastrian origin of the refined spirituality of the Sufis. The sublimity of the Persian faith lay in its conception of the unity of eternal spirit and the intimate association of the divine with all that is manifest. Arab Mohammedans believe in the unity of a personal God, but mankind and the world were, to them, mere objects upon which the will of God was exercised. The Sufis approached nearer to the Christian sentiment embodied in the phrase, Christ in us. The Persian conquerors of Hindustan carried with them the mysticism and spirituality of the Islamo-Magian creed. It was through Persia that India received its flood of Mohammedanism, and the mysticism and asceticism of the Persian form of Islam found congenial soil for development among the speculative ascetics of northern India. It is, therefore, only reasonable to suppose that any Hindu affected by Mohammedanism would show some traces of Sufi influence. As a fact, we find that the doctrines preached by the Sikh gurus were distinctly Sufistic, and indeed, the early gurus openly assumed the manners and dress of fakirs, thus plainly announcing their connection with the Sufistic side of Mohammedanism. In pictures, they are represented with small rosaries in their hands, quite in Mohammedan fashion, as though ready to perform zikr. Guru Arjun, who was fifth in succession from Nanak, was the first to lay aside the dress of a fakir. The doctrines, however, still held their position, for we find the last guru dying while making an open confession of Sufism. His words are, The Smiritis, the Sastras, and the Vedas all speak in various ways. I do not acknowledge one of them. O possessor of happiness, bestow thy mercy on me. I do not say I, I recognize all as thee. Sikanda Rajdi Vithya, page 81. Here we have not only the ideas but the very language of Sufis, implying a pantheistic denial of all else than deity. The same manner of expression is found in the Adi Granth itself, for example, Thou art I, I am thou. Of what kind is the difference? Translation, page 130. And again, in all one dwells, the one is contained. Page 41. Indeed, throughout the whole Adi Granth, a favourite name for deity is the true one, that is, that which is truly one, the absolute unity. It is hardly possible to find a more complete correspondence of ideas than that furnished by the following sentences taken from the Yusuf Wazuleka of Jami, the Persian Sufi, and the others from the Jabji and the Adi Granth. Jami says, Dismiss every vain fancy and abandon every doubt. Blend into one every spirit and form and place. See one, know one, speak of one, desire one, chant of one, and seek one. In Jabji, a formula familiar to every Sikh household, we find The Guru is Isa, Siva. The Guru is Gorak, Vishnu. Brahma, the Guru is the mother Parbati. I should know, would I not tell? The story cannot be told. O Guru, let me know the One, that the One liberal patron of all living beings may not be forgotten by me. In the Adi Granth we read, Thou recitest the One, thou placest the One in thy mind, thou recognizest the One. The One is in eye, in word, in mouth, thou knowest the One in both places, i.e. worlds, in sleeping the One, in waking the One, in the One thou art absorbed. India Office Manuscript, number 2484, folio 
568. It is not only with respect to the idea of the unity of God that this identity of expression is discernible, for other technical terms of Sufism are also reproduced in Sikhism. Thus the Sufi Fariduddin Shakraganj calls deity the light of life, and Jalaluddin speaks of flashes of his love, while Jami represents the light of the Lord of Angels as animating all parts of the universe. And Nizami exclaims, There fell a light as of a lamp into the garden of my heart, when he feels that a ray of the divine has entered into his soul. It is not difficult to collect many such instances from the works of Persian Sufis. Turning to Sikhism, we find that the Adi Granth is full of similar expressions. It is enough to cite the following exclamation of Nanak himself, In all is light, he is light. From his light there is light in all. India Office Manuscript No. 2484, Folio 35 And in another place he says, The luminous one is the mingler of light with himself, Folio 186. On Folio 51 we find, There death enters not, light is absorbed in the luminous one. Another favourite metaphor of Sufis for the deity is the Beloved. For example, when Hafiz says, Be thankful that the assembly is lighted up by the presence of the Beloved. This term is well recognised in Sikhism, thus in the Adi Granth, If thou call thyself the servant of the Beloved, do not speak despitefully of him. India Office Manuscript No. 2484, Folio 564 Love to the Beloved naturally puts joy into the heart. I long to meet the Lord, Prabhu. Therefore, why should I be slothful? Folio 177 Also, in my soul and body are excessive pangs of separation. How shall the Beloved come to my house and meet with me? And again, the Beloved has become my physician. India Office Manuscript No. 1728, Folio 87 The words used in Punjabi texts are Piriya, Pritam and Piri, a lover or beloved one. Another remarkable proof of Persian influence is found in the form of the Adigranth itself. It consists of a collection of short poems, in many of which all the verses composing the poem rhyme together, in singular conformity with the principle regulating the construction of the Persian Ghazal. This resemblance is rendered more striking by the fact that the name of Nanak is worked into the composition of the last line of each of the poems. This last characteristic is too persistent to be considered the result of accident, and while it is altogether foreign to the practice of Hindu verse, it is in precise accord with the rule of the correct composition of the Ghazal. The foregoing facts seem conclusive as to the influence of Persian Sufism on the origin of the Sikh religion. Dr. Trump, when discussing the philosophy of the Adi Granth, admits the intimate connection between Sikhism and Sufism in the following words. We can distinguish in the Granth a grosser and a finer kind of pantheism. In this finer shade of pantheism, creation assumes the form of emanation from the Supreme as in the system of the Sufis. The atomic matter is either likewise considered co-eternal with the absolute and immanent in it, becoming moulded into various distinct forms by the energising vigour of the absolute jyoti, light, or the reality of matter is more or less denied, as by the Sufis, so that the divine jyoti is the only real essence in all. Introduction to Translation of the Adi Granth, page 201. Any doubt that may remain on the question seems to be set at rest by the express statement in the life of Guru Arjun, who was urged by his followers to reduce to writing the genuine utterances of Nanak, because, by reciting the numerous verses and speeches uttered by other Sufis, which have received the name of Baba Nanak, pride and worldly wisdom are springing up in the hearts of men. 
Sikan de Raj di Vitia, page 29. And in the Adi Granth itself, we find the following remarkable verses ascribed to Nanak. A ball of intoxication, of delusion, is given by the giver. The intoxicated forget death. They enjoy themselves four days. The true one is found by the Sufis, who keep fast his court. Translation, page 23. Here we have not only a plain claim of kinship with the Sufis, but the incorporation of several of their favourite terms. The tradition of Nanak preserved in the Janam Saki are full of evidences of his alliance with Mohammedanism. He was a Hindu by birth, of the Bedi Katri caste, and was the son of the Patwari, or village accountant, of the place now called Nankana, in the neighbourhood of Lahore. In his very early days, he sought the society of fakirs and used both fair and unfair means of doing them service, more especially in the bestowal of alms. At fifteen years of age, he misappropriated the money which his father had given him for trade, and this induced his parents to send him to a relative at Sultanpur, in order that he might be weaned from his affection for fakirs. India Office Manuscript, number 1728, folio 29. His first act in his new home was to join the service of a Mohammedan Nawab named Daulat Khan Lodi, and while serving him he continued to give to fakirs all his salary except the bare subsistence he reserved for himself. While in the service of the Mohammedan, Nanak received the ecstatic exaltation which he felt to be divine inspiration. It is stated in the tradition of his life that Nanak went to the river to perform his ablutions, and that while so engaged, he was translated bodily to the gates of paradise. Then a goblet of Amrita, the water of life, was given to him by command of God. The command was, this Amrita is the goblet of my name, drink thou it. Then the Guru Nanak made salutation and drank the goblet. The Lord, Sahib, had mercy and said, Nanak, I am with thee, I have made thee happy, and whoever shall take thy name, they shall all be rendered happy by me. Go thou, repeat my name, and cause other people to repeat it. Remain uncontaminated from the world. Continue steadfast in the name, in almsgiving, in ablutions, in service, and in the remembrance of me. I have given to thee my own name, do thou this work. Folio 33 Here we have notions closely akin to those of the Sufis, who lay much stress on the repetition of the name of God, which they term Zikr, on religious ablutions, Wazu, and on meditating on the unity of God. Wahdaniya. No sooner had Nanak recovered from his trance than he uttered the keynote of his future system in the celebrated phrase, There is no Hindu, there is no Muslim, folio 36. The Janam Saki then goes on to say that The people went to the Khan, his former employer, and said, Baba Nanak is saying there is no Hindu, there is no Muslim. The Khan replied, Do not regard his statement, he is a fakir. A Kazi sitting near said, O Khan, it is surprising that he is saying there is no Hindu and no Muslim. The Khan then told an attendant to call Nanak, but the Guru Nanak said, What have I to do with thy Khan? Then the people said, This idiot is become mad. Then the Baba Nanak was silent. When he said anything, he repeated only this statement, There is no Hindu, there is no Muslim. The Kazi then said, Khan, is it right that he should say, There is no Hindu, there is no Muslim? Then the Khan said, Go fetch him. The attendant went and said, Sir, the Khan is calling you. The Khan says, For God's sake, give me an interview, I want to see thee. The Guru Nanak arose and went, saying, Now the summons of my Lord Sahib is come, I will go. He placed a staff upon his neck and went. The Khan said, 
Nanak, for God's sake, take the staff off of thy neck, gird up thy waist, thou art a good fakir. The Guru Nanak took the staff from off his neck and girded up his loins. The Khan said, O Nanak, it is a misfortune to me that a steward such as thou shouldst become a fakir. Then the Khan seated the Guru Nanak near himself and said, Kazi, if thou desirest to ask anything, ask now, otherwise this one will not again utter a word. The Kazi, becoming friendly, smiled and said, Nanak, what dost thou mean by saying there is no Hindu, there is no Muslim? Nanak replied, To be called a Muslim is difficult. When one becomes it, then he may be called a Muslim. First of all, having made religion, deen, sweet, he clears away Muslim wealth. Having become firm, religion, deen, in this way brings to an end the revolution of dying and living. India Office Manuscript number 2484, folio 84. When Nanak had uttered this verse, the Kazi became amazed. The Khan said, Kazi, is not the questioning of him a mistake? The time of afternoon prayer had come. All arose and went to the mosque to prayers, and the Baba Nanak also went with them. Nanak then demonstrated his supernatural power by reading the thoughts of the Kazi. Then the Kazi came and fell down at his feet, exclaiming, Wonderful, wonderful, on this one is the favour of God. Then the Kazi believed, and Nanak uttered this stanza. A real Muslim clears away self. He possesses sincerity, patience, purity of speech. What is erect he does not annoy. What lies dead he does not eat. O Nanak, that Muslim goes to heaven, be hisht. When the Baba had uttered this stanza, the Sayyids, the sons of the Sheikhs, the Kazi, the Mufti, the Khan, the chiefs and leaders were amazed. The Khan said, Kazi, Nanak has reached the truth. The additional questioning is a mistake. Wherever the Baba looked, there all were saluting him. After the Baba had recited a few stanzas, the Khan came and fell down at his feet. Then the people, Hindus and Muslims, began to say to the Khan that God, Kuda, was speaking in Nanak. India Office Manuscript, number 1728, folios 36 to 41. The foregoing anecdotes are taken from the India Office Manuscript, number 1728, but the ordinary Janam Sakis current in the Punjab vary the account somewhat by saying that when the Khan reproved Nanak for not coming to him when sent for, the latter replied, Hear, O Nawab, when I was thy servant I came before thee. Now I am not thy servant. Now I am become the servant of Khuda, God. The Nawab said, Sir, if you have become such, then come with me and say prayers, Niwaj. It is Friday. Nanak said, Go, sir. The Nawab, with the Kazi and Nanak, and a great concourse of people, went into the Jami Masjid and stood there. All the people who came into the Masjid began to say, Today Nanak has entered this sect. There was a commotion among the respectable Hindus in Sultanpur, and Jairam, becoming much grieved, returned home. Nanaki, perceiving that her husband came home dejected, rose up and said, Why is it that you are today so grieved? Jairam replied, Listen, O servant of Paramesur, God. What has thy brother Nanak done? He has gone with the Nawab into the Jami Masjid to pray, and in the city there is an outcry among the Hindus and Muslims that Nanak has become a Turk or Muslim today. India Office Manuscript number 2885, folio 39. From the foregoing, it is perfectly clear that the immediate successors of Nanak believed that he went very close to Mohammedanism, and we can scarcely doubt the accuracy of their view of the matter when we consider the almost contemporaneous character of the record from which extracts have been given and the numerous confirmatory evidences contained in the religion itself. 
it is particularly worthy of remark that a cup of Amrita, i.e. immortality, is considered the symbol of inspiration, just as Hafiz exclaimed, Art thou searching, O Hafiz, to find the waters of eternal life? And the same poet expresses his own ecstasy in a way almost identical with the reception according to Nanak at the gate of paradise. His words are, Then he gave into my hand a cup which flashed back the splendor of heaven so gloriously that Zura broke out into dancing and the lute player exclaimed, Drink! The staff, Mutaka, that is mentioned is also that of a fakir, on which a devotee supports himself while in meditation. Another significant fact is that when Nanak speaks of himself as the servant of God, he employs the word kuda, a Persian Mohammedan term. But when his brother-in-law Jairam speaks of God, he uses the Hindu word paramesur. It will also be noticed that Mohammedans are affected by the logic and piety of Nanak, and to them he shows himself so partial that he openly accompanies them to the mosque and thereby causes his Hindu neighbours and friends to believe that he is actually converted to the faith of Islam. But of course, the most remarkable expression of all is the emphatic and repeated announcement that there is no Hindu, there is no Muslim. This can mean nothing else than that it was Nanak's settled intention to do away with the differences between those two forms of belief by instituting a third course which should supersede both of them. Nanak's employer, in consequence of the foregoing manifestations of wisdom, became his devoted admirer. After this, Nanak undertook a missionary tour and it is noticeable that the first person he went to and converted was Sheikh Sajan, who showed himself to be a pious Mohammedan. Nanak then proceeded to Panipat, and was met by a certain Sheikh Tatiha, who accosted him with a Mohammedan greeting, Peace be upon thee, O Davesh, Salam Aleikah Daves, to which Nanak immediately replied, And upon you be peace, O servant of the peer. Aleikus Salamu Hopir K. Dastapez, India Office Manuscript No. 1728, Folio 48. Here we find Nanak both receiving and giving the Mohammedan salutation, and also the acknowledgement that he was recognized as a Davesh. The Punjabi form of the Arabic salutation is given, lest it might be thought that the special character of the words is due to the translation. The disciple then called his master, the peer Sheikh Sharaf, who repeated the salutation of peace, and after a long conversation acknowledged the divine mission of Nanak, kissed his hands and feet, and left him. Folio 52. After the departure of this peer, the Guru Nanak wandered on to Delhi, where he was introduced to Sultan Ibrahim Lodi, who also called him a Davesh. The previous conversations and acts are found to have awakened the curiosity of Nanak's attendant Mardana, who asked in surprise, Is God then one? To which Nanak firmly replied, God, Kuda, is one. Folio 55 This was intended to satisfy Mardana that there is no difference between the Mohammedan and the Hindu God. Nanak is next said to have proceeded to the holy city of Benares, and there he met with a pandit named Satrudas. The manuscript number 1728, folio 56, says, He came to this Nanak and cried, Ram, Ram. Seeing his, Nanak's, disguise, Beku, he sat down and said to him, O devotee, Bakat, thou hast no salgram, no necklace of tulsi, no rosary, no tika of white clay, and thou callest thyself a devotee? What devotion hast thou obtained? In other words, the pandit is made to challenge his piety because he has none of the marks of a Hindu upon him. Nanak explains his peculiar position and views and is reported to have converted the Hindu pandit to his own way of thinking. This anecdote also shows that the immediate successors of Nanak were aware that their great guru occupied an intermediate position between Mohammedanism and Hinduism, for we see that he is made to convert Mohammedans on the one hand 
and Hindus on the other. After this primary attack on Hinduism, Nanak is said to have converted some jogis, khatris, thugs, necromancers, witches, and even the personified Kaliyug, or present age of the world. These conquests over imaginary Hindus are obviously allegorical, though they certainly point to a well-recognized distinction between the teaching of Nanak and that of Orthodox Hinduism. The most significant associate Nanak found was undoubtedly Sheikh Farid. He was a famous Mohammedan peer and a strict Sufi who attracted much attention by his piety and formed a school of devotees of his own. Sheikh Farid must have gained considerable notoriety in his day, for his special disciples are still to be found in the Punjab, who go by the name of Sheikh Farid's Fakirs. This strict Mohammedan became the confidential friend and companion of Nanak, and if all other traditions had failed, this alone would have been enough to establish the eclectic character of early Sikhism. The first greeting of these famous men is significant enough. Sheikh Farid exclaimed, Allah, Allah, O Davesh, to which Nanak replied, Allah is the object of my efforts, O Farid. Come, Sheikh Farid, Allah, Allah only is ever my object. The words in the original being, Allah, Farid, Judi, Hamesa, O Sheikh Farid, Judi, Allah, Allah, India Office Manuscript, number 1728, folio 86. The use of the Arabic term Jud implies the energy of the purpose with which he sought for Allah, and the whole phrase is forcibly Mohammedan in tone. An intimacy at once sprang up between these two remarkable men, and Sheikh Farid accompanied Nanak in all his wanderings for the next twelve years. The intended compromise between Hinduism and Islam is shown not only in the fact of this friendship, but in the important circumstance that no less than 142 stanzas composed by Sheikh Farid are admitted into the Adi Granth itself. An examination of these verses still further proves the mingling of the two religions which Nanak affected. They are distinctly sophistic in tone, containing such lines as Youth is passing, I am not afraid, if love of the beloved does not pass. And still more pointedly, Full of sins I wander about, the world calls me a Davesh. While between those declarations of steady adherence to Islam comes the remarkable Hindu line, As by fire the metal becomes purified, so the fear of Hari removes the filth of folly. The fact that the compositions of a genuine Sufi should have been admitted into the canonical book of the Sikhs and that they should contain such a clear admixture of Hindu and Mohammedan ideas is conclusive evidence that Nanak and his immediate successors saw no incongruity in the mixture. As soon as Nanak and his friend Sheikh Farid began to travel in company, it is related that they reached a place called Bizia, where people applied cow dung to every spot on which they had stood as soon as they departed. Folio 94. The obvious meaning of this is that Orthodox Hindus considered every spot polluted which Nanak and his companion had visited. This could never have been related of Nanak had he remained a Hindu by religion. In his next journey, Nanak is said to have visited Patan, and there he met with Sheikh Ibrahim, who saluted him as a Muslim and had a conversation with him on the unity of God. Nanak expressed his views in the following openly sophistic manner. Thou thyself art the wooden tablet, thou art the pen, thou art also the writing upon it. O Nanak, why should the one be called a second? Folio 117 The peer asks an explanation of this verse in these words. Thou sayest there is one, why a second? But there is one Lord, Sahib and two traditions, which shall I accept and which reject? Thou sayest, the only one, he alone is one, but the Hindus are saying that in their faith there is certainty, 
and the Muslims are saying that only in their faith there is certainty. Tell me, in which of them is the truth, and in which is their falsity? Nanak replied, There is only one Lord, Sahib, and only one tradition. Folio 119 This anecdote serves still further to illustrate the intermediate position between the two religions ascribed to Nanak by his immediate followers. Shortly after the foregoing episode, Nanak was captured among the prisoners taken by the Emperor Baba, who seems to have been attracted by the Guru's piety and to have shown him some attentions. The chronicler informs us that all the people, both Hindus and Muslims, began to salute Nanak. Folio 137. After his release, Nanak recommenced his missionary work and is described as meeting a Mohammedan named Mian Mitha who called upon him for the Kalima, or Mohammedan Confession of Faith, folio 143, which leads to a long conversation in which Nanak lays emphasis on the Sufi doctrine of the unity of God. In this conversation, Nanak is made to say, The book of the Quran should be practiced, folio 144. He also acknowledged that justice is the Qur'an, folio 148. When the Mian asked him what is the one great name, Nanak took him aside and whispered in his ear, Allah. Immediately the great name is uttered, Mian Mitha is consumed to ashes, but a celestial voice again utters the word Allah, and the Mian regains life and falls at the feet of Nanak, folio 147. In precise conformity with this deduction is the tradition of Nanak's pilgrimage to Makkah. The particulars of his visit to that holy place are fully given in all accounts of Nanak's life, and although, as Dr. Trump reasonably concludes, the whole story is a fabrication, yet the mere invention of the tale is enough to prove that those who most intimately knew Nanak considered his relationship to Mohammedanism sufficiently close to warrant the belief in such a pilgrimage. In the course of his teaching in Makkah, Nanak is made to say, Though men, they are like women who do not obey the Sunnat and divine commandment, nor the order of the book, i.e. the Quran. Folio 212. He also admitted the intercession of Muhammad, denounced the drinking of bang, wine, etc., acknowledged the existence of hell, the punishment of the wicked, and the resurrection of mankind. In fact, the words here ascribed to Nanak contain a full confession of Islam. These tenets are, of course, due to the narrator of the tale and are only useful as showing how far Nanak's followers thought it possible for him to go. A curious incident is next related to the effect that Makhdum Bahuddin, the peer of Multan, feeling his end approaching, said to his disciples, O oh friends, from this time the faith of no one will remain firm, all will become faithless, Bayman. His disciples asked for an explanation, and in reply he delivered himself of an oracular statement, O oh friends, when one Hindu shall come to heaven, Bihisht, there will be brilliancy, Ujala, in heaven. To this strange announcement his disciples replied, Learned people say that heaven is not decreed for the Hindu. What is this that you have said? Folio 224. The peer told them that he was alluding to Nanak and sent one of his disciples to ask Nanak if he also had received an intimation of his approaching death. In this anecdote, we have the extraordinary admission from a Mohammedan that Nanak would succeed in breaking up the faith of Islam. It is in consequence of a Hindu's having conquered heaven itself and vindicated his right to a place in the paradise of Muhammad, that those who are then in the faith of the Prophet would lose confidence in his teaching. Here again the words employed are useful, for the peer is made to say that Muslims will become Bayiman, the Arabic term specially applicable to the faith of Islam, and heaven is called in the Punjabi story Bisat, that is Bihisht, the paradise of Muhammadans. For had the Hindu heaven been intended, some such word as swag or paralok 
or Brahmalok would have been used. The final incident in the life of this enlightened teacher is in precise accord with all that has been said of his former career. Nanak came to the bank of the Ravi to die, in conformity with Hindu custom, by the side of a natural stream of water. It is expressly said that both Hindus and Muslims accompanied him. He then seated himself at the foot of a sari tree, and his assembly of the faithful, Sangat, stood around him. His sons asked him what their position was to be, and he told them to subordinate themselves to the Guru Angad, whom he had appointed as his successor. They were to succeed to no power or dignity merely on the ground of relationship. No hereditary claim was to be recognized. On the contrary, the sons were frankly told to consider themselves non-entities. The words are, Sons, even the dogs of the Guru are not in want. Bread and clothes will be plentiful, and should you mutter, Guru, Guru, your life will be properly adjusted. Folio 238 The anecdote then proceeds in the following remarkable manner. Then the Hindus and Muslims who affirm in the name of God began to express themselves thus. The Muslims said, We will bury him, and the Hindus said, We will burn him. Then the Baba said, Place flowers on both sides, on the right side those of the Hindus, on the left side those of the Muslims, that we may perceive whose will continue green tomorrow. If those of the Hindus keep green, then burn me, and if those of the Muslims keep green, then bury me. Then the Baba ordered the assembly to repeat the praises of God, and the assembly began to repeat the praises accordingly. After a few verses had been recited, he laid down his head. When the sheet which had been stretched over him was raised, there was nothing under it, and the flowers of both sides remained green. The Hindus took away theirs, and the Muslims took away theirs. The entire assembly fell to their feet. Folios 239 and 240 The mixture of Hinduism and Mohammedanism is evident in this tradition. It is obviously intended to summarize the life of Nanak and the object of his teaching. He is not represented as an outcast and a failure. On the other hand, his purposes are held to have been fully accomplished. The great triumph was the establishment of a common basis of religious truth for both Mohammedan and Hindu, and this he is shown to have accomplished with such dexterity that at his death no one could say whether he was more inclined to Hinduism or to Mohammedanism. His friends stood around him at the last moment, quite uncertain as to whether they should dispose of his remains as those of a Mohammedan or as those of a Hindu. And Nanak is represented as taking care that the matter should ever remain a moot point. The final miraculous disappearance of the corpse is obviously intended to convey the idea that Nanak belonged specially neither to one party nor to the other, while the green and flourishing appearance of the flowers of both parties conveys the lesson that it was his wish that both should live together in harmony and union. The narrator of the life clearly wishes his history to substantiate the prophetic statement recorded at the commencement of his book in Folio 7, that at Nanak's birth, the Hindus said the manifestation of some god, Devata, has been produced, and the Muslims said some holy man, Siddiq, of God, Kuda, has been born. The most potent cause of the uncertainty as to Nanak's true position in the religious world arises from the initial fact that he was born a Hindu and necessarily brought up in that form of belief. He was a perfectly uneducated man, there being no reason to suppose that he could either read or write, or perform any other literary feat, beyond the composition of extemporaneous verses in his mother tongue. Guru Arjun, the fourth successor of Nanak, appears to have been the first chieftain of the fraternity who could read and write. The necessary result of Nanak's early associations was that all his ideas throughout life were substantially Hindu. His mode of thought and expression was Hindu. His illustrations were taken from Hindu sources, and his system was based on Hindu models. 
It must be borne in mind that Nanak never openly seceded from Hinduism or ever contemplated doing so. Thus, in the Saki of Mianmitha, it is related that toward the end of Nanak's life, a Mohammedan named Shah Abdul Rahman acknowledged the great advantages he had derived from the teaching of Nanak and sent his friend Mianmitha to the Guru so that he might derive similar benefit. Then Mianmitha said, What is his name? Is he a Hindu or is he a Muslim? Shah Abdul Rahman replied, He is a Hindu and his name is Nanak. Sikanda Raj Davithya, page 258. He struck a heavy blow at Hinduism by his rejection of caste distinctions, and on this point there can be no doubt, for his very words, preserved in the Adi Granth, are Thou, O Lord, acknowledgest the light, the ray of the divine in man, and dost not ask after caste. In the other world there is no caste. Translation of the Adi Granth, page 494. In consequence of this opinion, Nanak admitted to his fraternity men of all castes, his constant companions being spoken of as Sayyids and Sikhs, that is, Mohammedan and Hindu pupils. Sikhs have ever before them the intermediate character of their religion from the stanza 21 of the Japji, which says, Pandits do not know that time, though written in a Purana. Kazis do not know that time, though written in the Quran. Hindu scholars are told in the Adi Granth that they miss the true meaning of their religion through delusion. Reading and reading the Pandit explains the Veda, but the infatuation of Maya, delusion personified, lulls him to sleep. By reason of the dual affection, the name of Hari, i.e. God, is forgotten. Translation, page 117. In the same way, Nanak turns to the Muslim and says, Thou must die, O Mullah, thou must die. Remain in the fear of the Creator. Then thou art a Mullah, then thou art a Kazi, if thou knowest the name of God, Huda. None, though he be very learned, will remain, he hurries onward. He is a Kazi by whom his own self is abandoned, and the one name is made his support. He is and will be. He will not be destroyed. True is the Creator. Five times he prays, Miwaj Gujahi. He reads the book of the Quran. Translation, page 37. Nanak does not seem to have been particular as to the name under which he recognized the deity. He was more concerned with impressing on his companions a correct understanding of what deity was. The names Hari, Ram, Govind, Brahma, Parameswa, Khuda, Allah and so on are used with perfect freedom and are even mixed up in the same poem. The most common name for God in the Adi Granth is certainly Hari, but that does not seem to have shocked the Muslim friends of Nanak. Thus, in a poem addressed to Hari as the invisible, inaccessible and infinite, we are told that Peers, prophets, saliks, sadiks, martyrs, sheikhs, mullahs and dervishes, a great blessing has come upon them who continually recite his salvation. Translation, page 75. The chief point of Nanak's teaching was unquestionably the unity of God. He set himself firmly against the idea of associating any other being with the Absolute Supreme. This exalted idea of divine majesty enabled Nanak to treat with indifference the crowd of Hindu deities. To such a mind as that of Nanak, it would have been a sheer waste of time to argue, with any earnestness, about the attributes, powers or jurisdictions of a class of beings, the whole of whom were subordinate to one great, almighty and incomprehensible ruler. Without any overt attack on the Hindu pantheon, he caused the whole cluster of deities to subside into a condition similar to that of angels in modern Christianity, whose existence and operations may be the subject of conversation, but the whole of whom sink into utter insignificance compared with the central idea of the divine majesty. The one God, in Nanak's opinion, and it may be added in the opinion of all Sufis, was the creator of plurality of form 
not the creator of matter out of nothing. The phenomenal world is the manifestation of deity, and it is owing to pure illusion that the idea of separateness exists. In the Adi Granth we read, The cause of causes is the creator. In his hand are the order and reflection. As he looks upon, so it becomes. He himself, himself is the Lord. Whatever is made is according to his own pleasure. He is far from all and with all. He comprehends, sees and makes discrimination. He himself is one and he himself is many. He does not die nor perish. He neither comes nor goes. Nanak says he is always contained in all. Translation, page 400. Notwithstanding this conception that the Supreme One comprehends both spirit and matter and therefore is what is, he is nevertheless spoken of as in some way different from the creatures he has formed and has been endowed with moral and intellectual qualities. Thus we find in the Adi Granth, Whose body the universe is, his is not in it, the creator is not in it. Who is putting the things together, he is always aloof from them. In what can he be said to be contained? Translation, page 474. The soul of man is held to be a ray of light from the light divine, and it necessarily follows that, in its natural state, the soul of man is sinless. The impurity, which is only too apparent in man, is accounted for by the operation of what is called maya, or delusion, and it is this maya which deludes creatures into egotism and duality, that is, into self-consciousness or conceit, and into the idea that there can be existence apart from the divine. This delusion prevents the pure soul from freeing itself from matter, and hence the spirit passes from one combination of matter to another, in a long chain of births and deaths, until the delusion is removed and the entrammeled ray returns to the divine light whence it originally emanated. The belief in metempsychosis is thus seen to be the necessary complement of pantheism, and it is essential to the creed of a Hindu, a Buddhist, and a Sufi. In Sikhism, as in Buddhism, the prime object of attainment is not paradise, but the total cessation of individual existence. The method by which this release from transmigration is to be accomplished is by the perfect recognition of identity with the Supreme. When the soul fully realizes what is summed up in the formula so ham, I am that, i.e., I am one with that which was and is and will be, then emancipation from the bondage of existence is secured. This is declared by Nanak himself in the Adi Granth in these words. Should one know his own self as the Soham, he believes in the esoteric mystery. Should the disciple, Gurmukhi, know his own self, what more can he do or cause to be done? India Office Manuscript No. 2484, Folio 53 The principles of early Sikhism given above are obviously too recondite for acceptance among masses of men. Accordingly, we find that the pantheistic idea of absolute substance became gradually changed into the more readily apprehended notion of a self-conscious supreme being, the creator and governor of the universe. Here, Dr. Trump himself admits the influence of Mohammedanism when he says, it is not improbable that Islam had a great share in working silently these changes, which are directly opposed to the teaching of the Gurus. Introduction to the Translation of the Adi Granth, page 112. The teaching of Nanak was, however, very practical. His followers are daily reminded in the Japji that, without the practice of virtue, there can be no worship. In all that has preceded, we have confined ourselves strictly to the intimate relationship subsisting between early Sikhism and the Mohammedan religion. It is, however, necessary to allude to the fact that certain surviving relics of Buddhism had no small share in moulding the thoughts of the founder of the Sikh religion. 
a full examination of this part of the subject would be out of place in the present work. It must suffice to say that Buddhism held its position in the Punjab long after it had disappeared from other parts of northern India, and the abundance of Buddhistic relics, which are continually being unearthed in the district, prove the widespread and long-continued influence of the tenets of the gentle-hearted Buddha. Indications of this influence on early Sikhism are seen in its freedom from caste, in the respect for animal life, the special form of metempsychosis accepted, the importance ascribed to meditation, the profuse charity, the reverence paid to the seat of the guru, like the Buddhistic worship of the throne, Nanak's respect for the lotus, his missionary tours, and the curious union subsisting between the guru and his sangat. In the Travels of Guru Teg Bahadur, translated from the original Gurmukhi by an excellent scholar, Sirdar Atta Singh, we find the following remarkable sentence. The guru and his sangat are like the warp and woof in cloth. There is no difference between them. Page 37. In the Adi Granth, there is an entire Sukhmani, or poem, by Guru Arjun, wholly devoted to a recitation of the advantages of the society of the pious, the term employed being, however, in this case, Sad Kai Sang, folio 134. In addition to these points of resemblance, there is found in early Sikhism a curious veneration for trees, offerings to which were sometimes made, as will be seen by reference to pages 67, 70 and 83 of the travels of Guru Teg Bahadur just cited. In precise conformity with the tradition that Buddha died under a sal tree, we have seen that Nanak purposefully breathed his last under a sari tree. Anyone familiar with Buddhism will readily recognize the remarkable coincidences stated above, but the most conclusive of all is the positive inculcation of views identical with the crowning doctrine of Buddhism, the nirvana itself. The following is what Dr. Trump says on the subject. If there could be any doubt on the pantheistic character of the tenets of the Sikh gurus regarding the Supreme, it would be dissolved by their doctrine of the Nirban. Where no personal god is taught or believed in, man cannot aspire to a final personal communion with him. His aim can only be absorption in the absolute substance, i.e. individual annihilation. We find, therefore, no allusion to the joys of a future life in the Granth as heaven or paradise, though supposed to exist, is not considered a desirable object. The immortality of the soul is only taught so far as the doctrine of transmigration requires it, but when the soul has reached its highest object, it is no more mentioned, because it no longer exists as individual soul. The Nirban, as is well known, is the grand object which Buddha in his preaching held out to the poor people. From his atheistic point of view, he could look out for nothing else. Personal existence, with all the concomitant evils of his life, which are not counterbalanced by corresponding pleasures, necessarily appeared to him as the greatest evil. His whole aim was, therefore, to counteract the troubles and pain of this existence by a stoical indifference to pleasure and pain, and to reduce individual consciousness to its utmost limit, in order to escape at the point of death from the dreaded transmigration, which he also, even on his atheistic ground, had not ventured to reject. Buddhism is, therefore, in reality, like Sikhism, nothing but unrestricted pessimism, unable to hold out to man any solace except that of annihilation. In progress of time, Buddhism has been expelled from India, but the restored Brahmanism, with its confused cosmological legends and gorgeous mythology of the Puranas, was equally unable to satisfy the thinking minds. It is therefore very remarkable that Buddhism in its highest object, the Nirvana, soon emerges again in the popular teachings of the medieval reformatory movements. Namdev, Trilokan, Kabir, Ravidas, and so on, and after these Nanak, take upon themselves to show the way to the Nirvana as Buddha in his time had promised, and find eager listeners. The difference is only in the means which these Bhagats, or saints, 
propose for obtaining the desired end. Introduction to Translation of Adi Granth, page 106. Such, then, was the Sikh religion as founded by Guru Nanak. It is based on Hinduism, modified by Buddhism, and stirred into new life by Sufism. There seems to be superabundant evidence that Nanak laboured earnestly to reconcile Hinduism with Mohammedanism by insisting strongly on the tenets on which both parties could agree and by subordinating the points of difference. It is impossible to deny that Nanak in his lifetime actually did effect a large amount of reconciliation and left behind him a system designed to carry on the good work. The circumstances which led to the entire reversal of the project and produced between Mohammedans and Sikhs the deadliest of feuds does not come within the purview of the present article. It is enough to state that the process was gradual and was as much due to political causes as to a steady departure from the teachings of the founder of Sikhism. The Sikh fraternity was under the guidance of individual gurus from AD 1504 when Nanak received the spiritual impulse which gave birth to the new sect until AD 1708, a total of 203 years. After the death of Guru Govind Singh, the Adi Granth itself was taken to be the ever-present impersonal guide. Govind Singh was the tenth and last guru. He succeeded his father Teg Bahadur when only 15 years of age. He was brought up under Hindu guidance and became a staunch devotee of the goddess Durga. By his pronounced preference for Hinduism, he caused a division in the Sikh community. He introduced several important changes into the constitution of Sikh society. The chief among these was the establishment of the Khalsa, by which he bound his disciples into an army and conferred upon each of them the name of Singh, or Lion. He freely admitted all castes to the ranks of his army and laboured more earnestly over their military than over their religious discipline. The nature of the changes which Govind Singh effected in the fraternity is best shown by the fact that the followers of Nanak's own teachings separated themselves from him and formed a community of their own, rejecting the title of Singh. In other words, they clung to the religious and rejected the military idea. The spirit of tolerance, so marked during the lifetime of Nanak, was clearly gone, and in yet later times this hostility gave birth to the saying that a true Sikh should always be engaged in war with the Mohammedans and slay them, fighting face to face. After a turbulent reign, Guru Govind Singh was treacherously slain by the dagger of a Pathan follower. He refused to name a successor, telling his followers that after his death the Granth Sahib, or the Lord of the Book, was to be their guide in every respect. Sikanda Raj Divithya, page 79. The religion of Nanak began in large-hearted tolerance, but political causes operated to convert its adherents into a narrow-minded sect. The Hinduism which Nanak had disciplined reasserted its superiority under his successors and ultimately became predominant. While this change was in progress, the religious aspect of the movement became gradually converted into military and political propaganda. No contrast indeed could well be greater than that between the inoffensive and gentle-minded Nanak and the warlike and ambitious gurus of later times. But while we cannot help being painfully impressed by the apparently undying feud which still subsists between the Sikhs and the Mohammedans, it seems perfectly clear that the intention of the founder was to reconcile the differences between these creeds and that in this excellent work he attained a large measure of success. Adapted and abridged from the original. Four Part Three Yoga and the Sufis by Pundit Kishan Chand Nearly 60 years ago I was undergoing yoga training in northern India when I developed an intense interest in the history, antiquity and relationships to other systems of philosophy and practice. My teacher first told me that these interests were irrelevant 
and stood in the way of the attempted re-yoking with the infinite. As a somewhat westernised product of 19th century India, however, I persisted, until he said, Refusing you leave to study this matter will only produce a greater barrier to self-realisation. Therefore go, and find out about it, afterward returning to me when you feel that you can put it into an appropriate place in your mind. Thus released from immediate conflict between discipline and worldly matters, I begged the reverend gentleman to tell me, first, whether there was any relationship between yoga and other systems, and if there was, why it should be that yoga teachers and practitioners claimed such primacy and such almost personal possession of the system. There is, he told me, such a relationship. All higher knowledge is in fact one knowledge, Therefore all who attain to it, by whatever path, share the same knowledge and the same being. But most of the people who teach and who practice yoga do not know this. Therefore they cleave to a narrow interpretation. Furthermore, the relationship between yoga and the Sufis is very close. But how can we admit this on the ordinary, the social and mental level? For centuries the Hindus and the Muslims have been enemies, to admit that they share something is politically unwise. Now I knew, of course, that many Hindus worshipped at Sufi shrines throughout India, but I had always put this down to sheer superstition. After all, yogis themselves were declared to be absurd apostates by Hindu Brahmins who were the repositories of the Hindu faith. The imperial mogul prince Darashiko, in his book The Meeting of the Twin Seas, had, too, stated categorically that the experiences of the Sufis and of the yogis and Vedantins were identical. That, according to many Muslim scholars, was evidence of the prince's unbalanced mind. His brother, the Emperor Aurangzeb, agreed to have him put to death on the advice of zealots, partly on the basis of this book, which has been published by the Asiatic Society of Bengal. From the 10th or 11th centuries of this era, as the Indian historian Amir Ali had noted in a then recently published book, a large number of Sufi saints, both men and women, flourished in India and acquired great fame in their lifetime for sanctity and good work. Their tombs are, to the present day, the objects of pilgrimage to Muslims and, remarkable to note, to Hindus as well. They called themselves dervishes or fakirs, by their followers, they were honoured with the title of Shah or King. As far as the Vedantist interest was concerned, it seemed that Sufism was recognised by Indians as its equivalent. Indeed, the illustrious Nawab Amin Jung Bahadur was to write, I use Vedantism and Sufism as synonymous terms, and the Arabic word tasawuf as a generic term meaning divine sentiment to cover both. I have not found any material difference between the two systems, if systems they can be called. In my opinion, they are not systems at all, nor indeed are they any kind of religion in the sense of a course of practices allied to a set of beliefs, nothing more nor less than an attitude of mind, preparedness or readiness to act in a certain way, in the circumstances of each situation, a tendency to tolerate any form of worship which is neither unreasonable nor inhuman. It is this tolerant spirit which makes religious fanatics everywhere its deadly enemies. Their tolerance of all faiths is at once their virtue in the eyes of their friends and their vice in the eyes of their enemies. All religions are so many ways or paths, Mazahib, leading to the same infinite and absolute, call it truth, beauty, or what you like. Then, if these people had the same goal, did they perhaps have the same origins, which social and national, cultural and sectarian, even racial considerations had at times been allowed to obscure? I went to the foremost Hindu scholar, Radhakrishnan, he put into my hands the Indian classic which contains a review of major religions, the Dabistan, and pointed out a passage. 
The Sufis always were and are scattered among all nations of the world and are called in Persian Vezhadarun, internally pure, or Roshandil, enlightened minds, or Yekanabin, seers of unity. In the Hindu language they are called Rashisha, Rakasas, and Tapisha, Tapisis, Gayanisha and Gayani, Jnanis or Atmajnanis. If this was the tradition of the mystics of India, they not only connected with the Sufis on the plane of experience, they also went back far beyond the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, for he was some time between 300 and 150 BC, while the Persian tradition dated from the time when the Aryans of Central Asia had not split into the eastern and southern branches, which were later to be regarded as Persians and Hindus. Zoroaster himself, even, according to today's scholars, predated Patanjali by centuries. As Professor E. W. F. Tomlin noted, Patanjali probably engaged in the codification of many traditions. If the yogis of India claim the origins of their science in the teachings of the ancient Aryans, and the Sufis concur in a similar representation of their path among the same peoples, what other sources of traditions are invoked? Certainly Sufi history claims that Muhammad was a Sufi, and the first of the truly historical ones. They are able to avoid the necessity of characterizing the Prophet as the initiator of Sufism by the same formula which they use in the explanation of the Islamic faith itself. According to this conception, Muhammad was the reintroducer of the same monotheistic religion taught by Abraham, Moses, Jesus and other inspired men of the past. But what else does Sufi history reveal about Sufism? First of all, such great teachers in the Sufi chain of succession as Surawadi claim that it has always existed and that many of the pre-Islamic sages and lawgivers were Sufis as well as establishing social and philosophical systems. But the recognition of the Sufis as being of the same kidney as members of ancient philosophical schools, if there were substance in the matter, would have to come from sources outside Sufism itself. If the Sufis were anciently active in Persia, there should be traces of their contact with, for instance, the Greeks, their neighbours, and with the Egyptians, if there was a connection with Moses and others in that country, as the Sufis claim, and indeed with Jewish thinkers and devotees, if the relevance of the constant use of such Jewish figures as Elias in Sufi tradition were to be admitted. In 1856, the traveller Ubisini, in his Letters on Turkey, noted that the doctrine and institution of the Sufis was nothing else than the Sufism which existed in the East long previous to the coming of Muhammad. He continued to link it with the secret schools of the Pythagoreans and the Neoplatonists of Alexandria. It is thus that we see, more than a century before Muhammad, the two great sects which divide it, the Meshawans, walkers, and the Ishrakyuns, contemplatives, reminding us by the similarity of the names of a certain point and by a conformity of doctrines of the two great philosophical schools of Greece. And the Hebrews? Amir Ali notes, Although the Persian word dervish is significantly Muslim in its origin and meaning, dervishes have always existed in Western Asia. The minor prophets of the Hebrews, designated Nabin, were only the prototypes of the modern dervish. John the Baptist, who lost his life for his temerity before Herod's wife, acted exactly as hundreds of dervishes have done in later ages, challenging kings and princes in their palaces. It is perhaps worth noting that John the Baptist is honoured in the Middle East as a great Sufi master, and his tomb in a mosque in Syria is a place of pilgrimage for them. The Sufis in many parts of the East, because of their acceptance of Jesus as a teacher of the way, are characterized as secret Christians, 
and they regard the Baptist as the Sufi introducer of the great Sufi Jesus. So when Robert Graves speaks of identifiable Sufi traces in literature antedating our era by three millennia, and the earliest prescribed rules of yoga by upward of a thousand years, he may well be speaking of the stream of transmission which is different only in appearance, not in content. Naturally, in the Hindu environment, the teaching would have its roots in the Hindu culture, developed at an angle from the Persian Aryan form. Similarly, in the Hebrew, Christian and Islamic manifestations, the cultural overlay would require a similar diversity of expression. It is noteworthy that in the modern world, where the emphasis is away from religion and toward psychology and physique, that the two systems, yoga and Sufism, should find protagonists in these fields. It is well known, and much abominated by Hindu traditionalists, that the current emphasis on tranquility and bodily health among yoga mentors is not consistent with orthodox Hindu preoccupations. To some Western people, on the contrary, contemporary yoga is the thin end of the wedge of Hinduism. To the orthodox Hindu, it is blasphemy, with its admission of outcasts, with its admission of women, and with its placing the exercises first and not the inner development before permitting exercises. Similarly, in the case of the Sufi projection for a new community and in today's atmosphere, we find Idris Shah, the authoritative chief of the Sufi tradition, following his father in presenting the facets of Sufism which accord with present-day needs. As one Orientalist, Professor Williams, in a scholarly journal puts it, Sirdar Iqbal Ali Shah, starting about 50 years ago, was among the first of the Sufi leaders to express Sufi tenets and methods in terms which the West could understand, and he laid the foundation of much of the growing interest which now finds expression both in this country and throughout the English-speaking world in the determination to know more of the Sufi approach to life. This interest has taken the form, in many countries of the West as well as of the East, of a renewed study of the Sufi classics, with the aim of applying to the conditions of modern life the lessons which they teach and the methods by which the teaching is conveyed. These words, written five years ago, for me substantiated the unerring intuition of my yoga teacher, for on the first occasion upon which I had raised the subject with him, he had handed me an article published in a British journal of religion, The General Principles of Sufism by Siddhar Iqbal Ali Shah. The powerful link between the realized men and women of each tradition could be seen by the fact that the Siddhar, in spite of addressing himself in psychological terms to Western people, retained his skill in working with a local context by publishing such monographs as the one in Indo-Asian Culture in 1962, Sufism and the Indian Philosophies. So it seems to me that the words of the 12th century Sufi illuminate Ghazali in his Alchemy of Bliss are relevant to the differing projections of mysticism where he says, The enlightened man has three modes of expression. The first to those who know nothing, with them he must not upset them. Those who have local beliefs, he must express himself in terms of them. And those who can really understand reality, with them he can use whatever terminology or apparent ideas which ensure the necessary communication without fear of opposition. By choosing the psychological path and illustrating Sufic truths by means of it, Syed Idris Shah, his father, whom he succeeded, died in 1969, has not only acquired an audience far beyond any which a cultist or ecstatic could, he has also perhaps shown a way in which yoga research could move in learning how to present yogic ideas and practices far beyond the present very restricted circles in which they are cramped at the moment. In a nutshell, nobody will today object to psychology and its study, but how many millions still regard yoga as only Indian, only for slimmers, only a spiritual path, 
or only studied and practiced by a tiny minority of people. One way of looking at the possibilities of expanding yoga interest could be to seek for a possible range of ideas and practices beyond, predating even, the relatively few categories presented by Patanjali. Health, hygiene and tranquility are fine, and probably make an excellent introduction to something which is, in other places, represented as entirely a means of attaining release from karma laws, something which attracts only feebly those who do not believe in such a law. But the parallel tradition of Sufism, perhaps because it lacked a Patanjali to restrict or summarize, concerns itself with human evolution, with living in the ordinary world, with ecology, psychology and anthropology. Its protagonists, as poets and scientists as well as social activists throughout the centuries, have left a treasure of precedent and theory which powerfully attracts people all over the world. Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Jews, Zoroastrians, atheists and Shintoists, Buddhists and scientists. These are only some of the people who are involved in the current projection of Sufi thought and action everywhere. There are, it is true, many imitative groups, run by people of varying quality and intentions, going under the label of Sufi throughout the world today. But it is easy to discern the true tradition from the cult. All we have to do is to accept the definition of the Sufis themselves. By Sufi tradition, the true Sufi is the one who, in addition to any inward qualities, can show by social and vocational contributions in the community in which he lives that he excels. He can prove that he is in the world but not of it, to borrow their slogan. Sufi classical literature warns against teachers who accept all comers, against wearing strange clothes, against applying the same exercises and theories to everyone, against appearing odd, and also against claiming to be able to teach. All these are the crutches of the teacher who has nothing else. Perhaps, above all, the real Sufi insists on not allowing his pupils to estrange themselves from the rest of the community to which they belong. This is why true Sufi communities and their members are never to be found where you see all those strange people with fixed places of meeting, fixed practices, parrot cries, and a concentration upon the teacher and not the teaching. As my first teacher, still to my mind the greatest because he neither revered anyone nor allowed himself to be revered, insisted, Every cult is a form of yoga, yoking. But 99 out of 100 people, both putative teachers and imagined pupils, are yoked to the secondary. This is the yoga of failure. Aim for the yoga of the primary. This audio is made available by the Idris Shah Foundation and is copyright 2019. All rights reserved.